Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, we are all sort of taking a look at the weather today to see what's going to happen. Um, um, I know that can be a distraction here, but um, Dr. Sellers invited me to, to uh, come and talk a little bit today about some invasive plant work I've been doing. And I am a, an extension specialist at the University of Florida Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. I have worked closely with Dr. Sellers now for the last nine years uh, here at the University of Florida. And so we share a lot of common interests and common ground on dealing with a lot of invasive plants. Now, I know Dr. Sellers has a, has a range of pasture focus. My focus is primarily natural areas, you know, surrounding uh, those pastures and aquatics. Um, but my goal today is to talk to you a little bit about a couple of uh, things we've been working on for pepper tree and climbing fern. And I want to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. And even if we run over the 30 minutes, I'll be happy to stay on and continue to answer questions. Um, I think it's really important that um, these types of Zoom uh, interactions, um, we have some uh, yeah, as close to in-person time as we can get at the end of it. To, uh, so if you have other questions, other weed control issues, uh, definitely save them for the end and uh, bring them up and we'll get to it. Okay, um, so here we go. All right. So bottom line is, I like to show this as kind of a joke, and it's, it's sort of a fundamental reality we face. We live here in Florida. We have a warm climate. We have a growing season that's conducive for a lot of invasive plants growing 12 months out of the year. We don't get that cold winter reprieve. We have tons of water. Uh, we have nutrient-rich ecosystems. A lot of that is geologically derived. Um, we have uh, lots and lots of historic introductions of plants with good intentions and sometimes some bad outcomes. So the fundamental result is Florida really, like almost no other state, faces sort of an overwhelming issue with invasive species. And invasive plants are kind of uh, um, one of that category of invasive species. And so we sort of feel like our hair is on fire and just about everything's on fire when it comes to dealing with invasives sometimes, because every time we turn around, we're hearing about a new one that's coming into Florida. And so eventually some of us, we, we tend to just sort of accept this and, and just accept that we live in a state that is heavily invaded. But I'm here to say that um, we have a lot of important land and water here in Florida, and I don't think it's the time to give up and accept, um, but we have to really understand that invasive plant management is a long-term challenge and investment in a lot of cases. I wanna start a little bit with Brazilian pepper tree here, and I'm not gonna give you a lecture on the history of it. I know that you've heard these things many times before, but I just wanna show you this map of, uh, of, of distribution of pepper tree. And, you know, it wasn't 20 years ago, that was way further south. And so we are seeing pepper tree move up the peninsula, and we are now seeing it out in the Panhandle. And actually it was found on Eglin Air Force Base a couple of years ago in the far Western Panhandle. And so it's up in South Georgia now. And so it's a species that's continuing to move northwards. Um, it is definitely well beyond that lag phase and it is causing problems throughout much of the state now. And I, I expect the reality to be that just about every county in Florida will eventually have some presence of Brazilian pepper tree over the next decade. Um, so one technique that we rarely have talked about with woody shrubs um, is called hack and squirt. Now hack and squirt is an invasive plant management or woody plant management technique that is what I call sort of surgical operation. It is, we use surgical precision to make incisions or cuts into the side of a tree or woody species. And then we very carefully inject the herbicide into those cuts. And you can see here that um, we, um, we've made a hack down into the, the wood. We go through the outer bark. We go through the inner bark. Uh, that's the phloem tissue that transports all uh, the photosynthates from the leaves down to the roots. We go into the sapwood, and that's that xylem tissue that translocates water upwards from the roots to the leaves. And the cambium layer in between is the meristematic or uh, regenerative tissue that makes new sapwood and new phloem. So our goal with hack and squirt has always been to make a well and fill that well with a concentrated herbicide solution that allows that herbicide to effectively be delivered down to the roots and the root collar of the tree and also upwards into the canopy, uh, which would result in canopy brownout. Now this is an old silvicultural technique and we really have sort of ignored it for woody shrubs because they're often multi-stemmed, but we got to taking a look at this and I wanna share some stuff that we've figured out 
that can be a really effective way to go after Brazilian pepper tree. It's called the reduced hack and squirt approach uh, for pepper tree. And basically what I like about it is it takes the four gallon backpack off your back or you're not mixing spray volumes for foliar treatments, you know, in 100 gallon tanks. We basically have a machete and a 750 ml squirt bottle. And we can go after pepper trees like this very effectively and efficiently with this reduced hack and squirt technique. Now, the key always will be that everything I talk about is getting the herbicide into the hacks that you create. And you can see here with that squirt bottle is putting that herbicide directly into that hack with no runoff. And you're going to see this is important down the road. Now, most folks in the past have looked at big pepper trees like this and said, yeah, there's no way I can hack and squirt that because I have to do a continuous series of hacks all the way around it in order to effectively control it. With my technique that we've developed, you don't have to do that. We have a very limited number of hacks on these stems and you're gonna see just how effective this is. Now, it uses one specific herbicide. This is Method 240SL. I'm not here to sell you this herbicide, but I'm here to talk about it because this is what we have found to be extremely effective at this reduced hack and squirt approach. Now, Method is a, um, it is very similar to the other auxin type herbicides you're familiar with from pastures like in rangelands like Remedy. So it's similar to triclopyr. It's very similar to uh, a number of the other auxin herbicides like Milestone. And so it's got that tip classic auxin type symptomology. Now, generally, method is relatively non-selective and it's a very strong herbicide. And we like to say it's a little more like a mazapir than triclopyr in terms of soil residual activity and broad spectrum activity. So where we start with this is a 50% solution of it for a reduced hack and squirt. That means mixing a very small amount in a squirt bottle. Okay, so the great thing about this is you can start very small. You can mix very small batches and actually treat quite a few stems with this approach. Okay, now how do we determine how many hacks it's going to take to kill these pepper trees? So we do a couple of things here. Uh, we have a machete and most machetes are about two feet long or 24 inches. We like to say 24 inches is a pretty good standard hack height because that's generally a comfortable hack height to make a downward 45 degree angle incision into, uh, around, into and around the stems. I have these two liter bottles that are sort of plastered across the tree here, you'll see. And basically a two liter Coke bottle is four inches in diameter, very straightforward there. And so what we're saying is one hack literally for every four inches of stem diameter. So that results in most pepper tree stems only needing one hack. That means you don't have to girdle all the way around them. You just make a single hack on one side that you're going to be able to put the herbicide into for all the primary stems. So you can see here on this tree, um, you're looking at uh, all those stems and sort of assessing exactly what the diameter is. You don't have to measure these things and you're going to get a really good visual and rule of thumb the more of this you do. And so this is not an absolute universal thing. Smaller stems, no problem. Even a little bit bigger stems, a single hack is often very good too. And so it's, it's a general rule of thumb to sort of help you begin to understand what do I need to do to, ex to effectively treat this tree. All right. So basically, uh, I've got some notes here that will be there for the presentation for you. <clears throat> okay, so you can see there I pull the Coke bottles away and we're looking at a number of hacks that we're going to make at 24 inches for each of these stems. And so instead of girdling all the way around, we can quickly make about six, seven, eight hacks there uh, to control this tree. Okay, so... Basically, we need, if you have little whiplet stems around the base that are less than an inch in diameter attached to these big trees, you can ignore those completely. You make one hack for all those stems that are less than a soda bottle wide, two hacks for one to two soda bottles, and for those really big pepper trees, three hacks will do it uh, for those eight to 12 inch diameter stems, okay? Evenly space those around if you can. Um, if not, then, then put them, try to separate them a little bit to get the herbicide into the tree. Never hack above other hacks. Always space them out just a little bit so that um, you're effectively going to get that herbicide to, to translocate throughout the tree. All right. Here's some examples of one hack per stem. You can see um, on this uh, picture on the left, uh, there's one, the, the hacks are in black there circled in black, uh, and you can see the applicator came in, made those on the top side where they were easiest and, the herb and would hold the herbicide best. The pictures on the right, you can see there's some little tiny stems that you're going to ignore. And then those slightly bigger stems, one hack per stem, uh, is going to do a great job on completely killing that tree. 
So this really, this technique um, really stressed some people out because they said, there's no way this is going to work. We've tried hack and squirt before with, with triclopyr products, and we've just not seen good control. And with method, it is extremely effective. Now, it is important that you get the herbicide into the hack. And this is where it takes a little bit of practice and getting a squirt bottle you're comfortable with that delivers about one milliliter per stroke is the best thing you can do. Because generally on a hack this size, it will hold about a milliliter of solution when you inject it in pretty slowly. And so if you get a Home Depot squirt bottle, um, some of them, you gotta be careful because some of them will put out two or three milliliters of solution per stroke. We need a squirt bottle that puts out one mil per stroke to be most effective and to really deliver only the amount of herbicide you need. A blue spray indicator is fantastic. You can see how easy it is to see that in the hack. Without it, it can be very difficult because as soon as you make this hack and put the herbicide in, it is taken into the tree extremely fast. And you will not even be able to tell you put anything in that hack 15 minutes later in most cases. So the blue spray indicator will mark it and you will know, you will know, you will know that you treated that hack and got the herbicide into it without runoff down the stems. It takes a little bit of practice, but you can train folks to do this very, very easily on pepper tree and a lot of other woody invasives. Now, how effective is this technique? We've done a ton of work in South Florida um, where we have compared basal bark applications with Garlon 4, Remedy, or Tricera um, at, a, at either a 10 or 20% on a volume to volume basis where we've basaled around the, every, the base of every tree. We've compared that to method herbicide and we actually compared it to milestone herbicide too. 540 days out, that's, that's basically two growing seasons out and we are seeing extremely effective defoliation of our targets there. And it's comparable between basal bark application and the, the reduced hack and score technique with method. Milestone wasn't quite as good We'll get into that a little bit more here in a second. But in general, this technique has effectively worked as good as basal bark application for Brazilian pepper tree. Now, if you're familiar with basal bark, it's not a lot of fun. It's really tough on pepper tree, carrying those four gallon backpacks through dense stands of pepper. And um, just getting around the base of the pepper trees is tough uh, with a basal bark application. And so the hack and squirt really frees you up to be more nimble, to be more mobile, moving through pepper tree stands with much less baggage, much less weight, and you're not carrying a spray wand, uh, you're not catching a hose on everything. And so when we have surveyed applicators who have been testing our new approach, they love the reduced hack and squirt approach because it gets that weight off their back and it helps them navigate a whole lot better. All right, now this is, I say frequency of defoliation, but this is actually mortality. And so uh, 10 is 100% mortality. And you can see that method with a reduced hack and squirt is comparable to what you would expect from basal bark applications approaching 90% kill or higher. And in most cases, you're going to see 100% kill with method on almost all trees you treat. The really, really big ones are where we tend to see a little bit of resprouting, uh, but even that with method is relatively infrequent. Milestone, however, did, was not effectively killing the trees to the level of either method, reduced hack and squirt, or basal bark with Carvalon 4. So we're not really encouraging the use of milestone for this right now, but definitely method in this case. Okay, what it means for you. So this is an alternative to basal bark application for pepper tree. Um, we have done extensive research on this. We've gotten it published. We are recording uh, YouTube training videos on this. And I already have PowerPoints training modules ready to go on this. And I'll be happy to share it with you. It is extremely effective on pepper tree and just about every other woody invasive we tested it on. The only one we've struggled with is lead tree, but literally every other woody species we've done this on has been effective. Chinese tallow tree, extremely effective. It's really good on Australian pine. It's great on Suriname cherry. It's, it's great on, um, basically if it's got a woody stem big enough to hack, method has been very effective with this. Now, some of the cool things, it uses 95% less herbicide than basal bark application. And it's similar in application time to basal bark application, which is nice. Eliminates that need to carry it. And again, this is that non-crop natural area treatment. It's, you're not gonna be using this out in your grazed pastures at this point, uh, but we are working to see if we can make that happen in the next few years. So this is an option. And if you have more questions about it, I can share a lot more information with you about this. Okay, 
moving on here because I'm already behind. Um, a world climbing fern. This is another one. This is probably one of the worst wetland plants that we have in South Florida now. It is extremely aggressive. You can see uh, it is smothering uh, areas. Uh, that picture on the left is just an entire forest ecosystem that has been overwhelmed by a world climbing fern in the Everglades, um, blanketing over every single tree there. Um, this is a, a fern species, so it reproduces by spores, which blow in the wind. And you can see it has fertile leaflets on that bottom right picture, and that's where the spores come from. And it will produce some of these throughout the year, so there's not a single single set time it makes them, but it, but spore production can often be heavier in the late summer into the fall. Now, it also regenerates from creeping rhizomes and these black scaly rhizomes that are just below the soil surface. Um, they are impossible to hand pull. We have tried hand pulling as a technique. It is not effective. They break off and you do not effectively control the species. Okay, so you can see um, oftentimes we will see this type of blanketing growth around sloughs, um, around canals, around forested wetlands where they just overtake everything, overtake everything and tend to collapse the canopy structure. Um, Younger infestations tend to look like this. These look like pretty overwhelming types of infestations, but this was actually down on Deluca, um, just uh, nor uh, by Yeehaw Junction, where we identified a whole lot of areas that were really heavily infested with, with old world climbing fern on the new UF property there. And we are very grateful for that property. It's going to make a fantastic area in terms of researching uh, invasive plant management for a number of things. To control... Old world climbing fern, we've always said you have to poodle cut it. And you can see on the left picture there, the poodle cutting is using a machete or something to sever all the climbing vines. Everything above dies and then spraying everything below with a pretty hot solution of a glyphosate product, about a 3% volume to volume. Some folks get it down to two, but in general, that's pretty much contractor standard. Okay. If you try to spray without poodle cutting. And you can see the picture on the right there, everything above the spray line survives. So you don't get effective translocation upwards enough to kill the rachis or the, the vines above the spray zone. And it's just too tall up in the trees to effectively foliar spray it without an aerial application. So we do have to poodle cut when we do this. So glyphosate has always been our, our tool of choice there back in 2015. We remember this controversy with glyphosate about claiming that uh, Roundup caused cancer. So the EPA, and we saw, we have a lot of lawsuits regarding that. Um, the reality is the World Health Organization never classified glyphosate as a carcinogen or cancer causing agent. They simply reclassified it to probably carcinogenic based upon the data they were looking at. Now, the EPA disagrees with them and they have reviewed the data multiple times and they have concluded that glyphosate is not likely to cause cancer. They have mandated no changes to glyphosate labels regarding this issue and they have actually gone so far as to prevent California from enacting Proposition 65 language on glyphosate labels that would say it does cause cancer. Now, the EPA is reviewing glyphosate regarding endangered species and that's an entirely separate issue um, and they are going through that process right now, which is going to take several years in an upcoming biological opinion. That will be the thing that could potentially change glyphosate use patterns. But as for now, nothing has changed. And the EPA says the data does not support glyphosate as causing cancer. Now, UF has always said, look, it's a useful tool if you follow all safety recommendations. Um, we're not trying to sell it. We're not telling you to use it, but we're saying that we agree with the EPA on the current safety of glyphosate as not being a carcinogenic. And so we put out a white paper on this um, to sort of uh, support that stand. And nothing's changed on that in the last uh, six years since we actually did that. Okay, we always stand on the backbone of IPM of using all reasonable options in concert to manage pests, whatever they are, including invasive plants like old world climbing fern. If we rely too heavily, on glyphosate, we are going to have problems down the road anyway. So we don't do that. Now, a lot of folks have tried to get away from glyphosate. And so we have responded to that in doing several studies looking at other herbicides uh, for control of old world climbing fern. What you see here is data from 
a triclopyr study comparing three different formulations of triclopyr, Tricera, Vaslan, and Garlon 3A, all aquatic labeled products. Um, that, and what you see here is compared to Roundup Custom, at 360 and 600 days after treatment, there are no statistical differences. Those all have Bs, meaning they are not different statistically. So that a 1.1% solution of Tricera or Vaseline, one and a half of Garlon 3A is all equivalent in terms of efficacy on overall climbing fern a couple of years out compared to that glyphosate treatment that we have historically utilized. So we have done this at multiple locations. We have done it operationally with contractors and it has been very consistent in terms of its efficacy. An interesting thing that we have seen is when we switch to triclopyr, we are actually seeing less native fern damage and we are seeing better native fern recovery. So looking out three years out, almost in those same plots, we have seen better fern recovery. And this is in natural areas. I know that, that we're not eating ferns or grazing ferns in general, but from a native ecosystem perspective, this is a good thing. So we're finding out that a switch to triclopyr can actually be beneficial to a lot of your herbaceous fern community compared to that glyphosate application. So basically what this means is if you want to get away from glyphosate, we have multiple triclopyr products that are effective for overall climbing fern control. Now with this, typically you can cut herbicide use by about 50% um, compared to the 3% Roundup custom or other glyphosate product. You got several formulations to choose from, three labeled for use in aquatic situations, which is what we normally recommend for overall climbing fern in general um, because it grows in such wet areas. And we see some better fern tolerance. The one issue with triclopyr we see is over application around the base of trees and uh, where we're seeing some potential damage on maples and uh, some other tree species. So we have to encourage people to be careful if they are switching to triclopyr um, to make sure their applicators are not heavy handed around the base of trees when they're doing this. Okay, so to wrap this up, um, we are working on a number of new trainings. And so we've shifted to YouTube quite a bit here. We're doing IPT, Individual Plant Treatment Techniques trainings. And I'm really doing these to lay out a standard for application techniques for all of these different approaches from basal bark, cut stump, hack and squirt and foliar. We have two already done and they're on our YouTube site at the UF IFA Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. Uh, that can be accessed through this site, um, plants.ifas.ufl.edu. We've developed a number of management guides and videos. These are two page management guides. I'll show you a picture of one for a number of species that you are dealing with in South Florida and videos on basal bark application, cut stump application, syngonium or arrowhead vine management. And we'll be having a reduced hack and squirt pepper tree one up in the next few weeks. Um, and we're just going to continue to produce this type of content. These two page management guides are recommendations that lay out herbicide recommendations by IPT approach, as you can see here, with a ton of considerations for things like um, adjuvants, seasonality, hydrology, non-target damage, retreatment intervals, the things you really need to be thinking about in terms of invasive plant management. We are going to have, we have eight of these done. We'll have another eight done here in the next couple of months. And uh, we're gonna continue to crank these things out. We found they are extremely useful, quick reference guides for invasive plant management. Uh, this is the uh, YouTube site, um, um, or this is the site that will take you right to the YouTube videos, which are the instructional uh, treatment videos uh, with a lot of in-field videos and in-classroom teaching type videos on breaking down all the aspects of invasive plant treatments. So where my research program is headed from here, um, we will continue to work on pepper tree and climbing fern. These are two of the worst in Florida. We're always working to become more efficient, more effective, and um, in, our, in our control methodologies uh, for these species. We have some aquatics that are really up and coming like Cuban bulrush is becoming a really, really bad problem in our lakes and uh, waterways. Um, it's time to revisit Kogon grass. We're opening up a big Kogon grass project we have ongoing now looking for some alternatives to glyphosate nemazapir to see if we can figure out some effective but more selective management approaches that we can utilize both in non-crop natural areas all the way into grazing lands. All right, um, a number of other projects we're focused on, again, more overall climbing fern, gametophyte work, wetland nightshade is another growing problem in South Florida, java plum, early facacia lead tree, 
The list just goes on and on, but we have active projects on all of these where we are continuing to work out refinements of management strategies. So with that, I want to stop and um, I will be happy to take any questions on these techniques or any other invasive plant control questions in general. Thank you very much for your time today. And I, I hope and pray everyone is safe uh, with the weather as we go forward. So I'm canceling, closing out of that, coming back. And let's go to questions. And uh, if you have questions, you can just unmute and ask them or type them into the chat box. And uh, let's go. Thank you, Dr. Enlow. It looks like you might have a few questions in the chat. Awesome. Okay. All right. Christina Russo asked the question, do you have a spray bottle you recommend for one mil per spray? So one thing I would say is get on U.S. Plastics website. They have a ton of spray bottles and they provide better technical specifications than just about anybody. And the nice thing is you buy the first batch of them and, and then you can just buy the spray headers themselves that attach to the bottles by the case after that if you need to. And so they, U.S. Plastics is a good source of spray bottles. Home Depot, um, the Home Depot generic HDX bottles are as close to one mil as, as I've seen from the, the box stores. Um, feed and seed stores can vary tremendously, like the, the ZEP brands. Those are typically really high output volumes, um, as are the Spray Masters, the gray bottles. Those are like two to 3.5 milliliters. And so I don't recommend those for this technique, but we do have options. Uh, take a look on U.S. Plastics website. Ace Hardware has a one mil spray bottle. Their standard is pretty good. Um, and uh, that one has been very effective. We used it in a lot of the research. So yes, spray bottles differ radically across brands, but within the same model brand, we have found they are extremely consistent. And we've done a number of testing of a number of bottles to figure that out, okay? Uh, the links to training modules, Lee Amos, thanks for the question. Um, so basically, Ian Talty has already done that and shared that link uh, from plants.ipas.ufl. So that's there. And um, be sure to check back on that site over the next few months. It's going to continue to grow like crazy with a lot more management guides and a lot more training videos. And these training videos, we try to keep them short um, into like little 10 minute videos that are sort of sectioned into targets treatments, tools, techniques, timings, and trouble with all those different sections. And so um, I think that uh, that approach, you can sort of digest a little bit at a time, rainy days, get, uh, get your applicators, your crews um, to take and watch them. And they can be really useful in terms of better understanding the science behind these techniques. Okay. Moving on, Lee Amos, uh, if it's okay to ask another plant, treating rose natal grass with glyphosate foliar, are the seeds killed by the application? Excellent question, Lee. Okay, rose natal grass is one of those extremely frustrating invasive grasses here because it has a very short um, juvenile stage, meaning it germinates and can be flowering and producing new seed in six weeks following germination. Six weeks seed to seed, we like to say, which means you can have multiple generations a year and uh, it can just really give you headaches because you spray it out and the next crop germinates and um, and just keeps coming back. And so rose natal grass with glyphosate, yes, the foliar applications will kill it, but if it is flowered and the seeds have hardened but are still attached to the plants, then no, the glyphosate will not kill them. If it is an early flowering before the seeds are filled, Yes, you can get glyphosate translocation into those seeds and they will be killed, but that's a really difficult window to exactly tell you. So I can't give you a calendar date or anything like that. Um, it's, it's just, it's when the seeds are still soft and, and, and milky, basically they're not hardened yet. That's the last chance you would have for glyphosate to be effective. Um, so you don't need to hand collect seeds prior to foliar treatment, I would say. Um, I mean, if you wanna do that, that's fine. Um, but uh, the reality is you've got a seed bank there in general. Um, other herbicides, some folks have had some success with Plateau herbicide, Amazepic, but it's been real hit and miss. We've been working on a new herbicide called Esplanade uh, or Indazaflam as the active ingredient. It is a pre-emergent only herbicide, so it's not going to kill 
the established clumps of rose natal grass, but it is effective on stopping the seeds as they germinate in the soil. We've seen pretty good success with fall applications, a little bit better than spring applications. The problem is if you're trying to restore a site, it can also inhibit the germination of some of the species you're trying to seed. So it works best in areas that already have some established perennial cover of other species. Um, and, and uh, but the issue there is killing the established bunches. So we are still, we got a long ways to go on rose natal grass. Um, we, that is one we definitely need to make some headway on. Cost comparisons, reduced hack and squirt with method versus regular hack and squirt with glyphosate. Okay, so Christine, excellent question here. And there's some sticker shock associated with method about 300 bucks a gallon. So, or 325, depending on the, or where you're getting it. Um, but if you, if you take and start to look at uh, the amount of um, herbicide being applied in terms of hack and squirt, that costs, we were calculating at about 35 to 40 bucks an acre. Now with glyphosate, if you make singular hacks in the side of a stem, you will not kill the pepper tree, okay? So with glyphosate, you would need to make evenly spaced or continuous hacks all the way around every single stem to effectively kill it. Um, and so you're, the difficulty in that is why people have not done it in terms of hack and squirt. This is why I say get a quarter method and start very small and determine if you like what you see. And, um, and But over time, it's sort of a radical departure from glyphosate approaches. We've typically recommended glyphosate as a cut stump treatment or as part of a foliar treatment, uh, but rarely have we used it as a hack and squirt for pepper tree. So yes, there is sticker shock there and I, I hate that. It's very frustrating, um, but start with a quart and um, mix a very small amount in a spray bottle because it will, a small amount will go a long way. And, you know, it's one of those things, it'll stay, it'll, it's pretty stable for a few weeks within that spray solution um, in general. So you can keep a little bit in a spray bottle. I would not do that all the time. And I certainly wouldn't mix large batches and do that. But to have a little bit in a 750 ml spray bottle in the back of your truck, that, uh, that you could hit a few trees just to see how it works. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Okay, any other questions? Nope. Okay, listen folks, I really appreciate your time. I, my email's in the presentation. Feel free to reach out to me if you have more questions. If you would like me to email you a PowerPoint training that goes through super detailed step-by-step -step for the hack and reduced hack and squirt approach, I will share that with you immediately. Send me an email and I'll, I'll share it through Dropbox link. And, um, and we will be putting that on our website very soon in terms of the YouTube training module for that, okay? So thank you for your time and I hope everybody has a, a good, safe day. I'll put my email, I will type my email address into the chat, right? Okay, thank you, Dr. Enlow. Boom, there we go. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Um, I'm going to take just a moment to share a few upcoming events. So I hope you can see my screen. I think you can. Um, our next ONA highlight is going to be held on February the 13th, and it is going to be with the South Florida Bee Forge program. They're going to be sharing about their programs and resources. So I hope you can come back and join us for that. Whenever I share the recording from today's program with you, I'll include the link to register for that. Also, this month we have on January the 24th, the 41st annual Florida Cattlemen's Institute and Allied Trade Show in Okeechobee. That registration ends on the 20th if you'd like for the $5 registration or $10 at the door. So I'll share this program flyer with you as well as the next. Farm Bureau with the Sarasota County Extension Office is having a Progressive Agriculture Safety Day for students. That's on a Saturday, February the 3rd at the Sarasota County Farm Bureau Office um, or Field Building. Going to be a really awesome program. I was um, privileged to attend last year, and so 
Please get signed up for that soon if you can attend. One free adult is allowed with each paying student, and the cost is $5. If you're not already doing so, we invite you to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and have a very active YouTube channel. And if you do not already receive our weekly Friday newsy emails, I invite you to send me an email at the address shown on the screen, and I'll get you signed up so that you can stay in touch with us and hear about all the interesting events we have coming up as well as the, the news that happens each week. So again, Dr. Enloe, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And everybody that's out there, um, we will be sending you an email, if not tomorrow, by the next day with this recording, as well as a link to our website where you will find a copy, a handout copy, PDF form of Dr. Enloe's presentation for you to access and download or print for your records. And we hope that we can see you again in February. So have a great day.